This is chapter 26, Concepts of Basic Nutrition and Cultural Considerations. These are just your, um, your theory objectives for this chapter, which are uh, one, review the structure and function of the gastrointestinal system, two, use the components of the United States Department of Agricultural MyPlate website to assist patients in planning their diets, and three, list medical conditions that may occur as a result of protein, calorie, vitamin, and mineral deficiency or excess. This is the clinical practice objective, identify patients at risk for nutritional deficits. Okay, so adequate nutrition begins with good dental hygiene and periodontal health and ends with uh, the appropriate elimination and sanitation. So here you have um, the structures that are involved in the digestive system. And we'll go through each of these, the mouth, the teeth, the tongue, the pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestines, large intestines, and the anus. Um, and then you have some accessory organs as well that are also considered a part of the gastrointestinal or GI system, which are the salivary glands, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. This figure is actually in your uh, your textbook, uh, figure 26-1, and it just kind of goes through showing you um, the GI system uh, in the body so you can kind of see how everything is laid out uh, starting um, with the mouth and on down um, to the rectum. Digestive processes begin in the mouth with chewing. Uh, chewing, salivating, and swallowing. The tongue provides the sense of taste, and saliva is produced by three pairs of glands, the parotid, the submandibular, and the sublingual. The parotid glands are the largest salivary glands, and you have one on each side. So every person must have the capability to chew. If not, changes need to be made to the food consistency to try to remedy the situation. Hydration also needs to be adequate um, for the production of saliva. In the process of chewing stimulates saliva in the digestive process. Um, so when you're assessing, you wanna assess the color and the condition of the lips when first doing an overall assessment. And then you want to make sure you also assess under the tongue to check for lesions, open areas, and, um, you know, the condition uh, uh, under the tongue. All right, the pharynx or the throat uh, allows the passage of food from the mouth to the esophagus. The pharynx assists in the swallowing process and secretes mucus that aids in the digestive process. The epiglottis is a thin uh, leaf-shaped structure that lies directly behind the root of the tongue. When food is swallowed, the epiglottis closes over the larynx and the soft palate lifts to block the nasal cavity. This action keeps food and fluid from being aspirated into the airway. So you don't want food that uh, when people have difficulty swallowing, um, they run the risk of this process not happening and that's how we get food or uh, fluids into the airway, possibly causing something um, called aspiration pneumonia or something if uh, food or fluid gets into the lungs. The esophagus, which is a muscular hollow tube, um, moves food from the pharynx to the stomach. When food is swallowed, the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes and the food moves into the esophagus. Peristalsis then propels the food toward the stomach. The gastroesophageal sphincter at the lower end of the uh, esophagus normally, normally it remains closed to prevent uh, any reflux of gastric contents. Uh, the sphincter opens during swallowing, belching, or vomiting. So that lower esophageal sphincter, a lot of times when you have people with GERD or something, that sphincter, sphincter has weakened for a variety of 
reasons and it allows food to come back up into the esophagus so it it's closed and then when food's passing through it'll relax so that food can go um, into the stomach now um, during the assessment process if the patient has dentures or something um, ask them to remove the dentures so that you can you know properly assess the condition of the gum gums you want to uh, make sure you know there are no lesions or infections or things like that on the gums because um, if you do have lesions or infections or things like that that can uh, cause difficulty with the chewing process and so then uh, it, when if you have difficulty with the chewing process because it's going to be painful or whatever then nutrition can be altered or things like that um, as well so you want to make sure you assess the condition of the gums a lot of times people with um, ill-fitting or improper fitting dentures um, develop these sores so you also want to make the make sure the dentures um, fit appropriate as well Sorry, the stomach is a reservoir for food it's a dilated sac like structure that lies um, obliquely in the left upper quadrant below the esophagus and the diaphragm it's to the right of the spleen and partly under the liver the stomach contains two important sphincters the cardiac sphincter which protects the entrance to the stomach and the pyloric sphincter which um, guards the exit the stomach has three major functions um, number one it stores food number two it mixes food with gastric juices and number three it passes the chyme which is the watery mixture of partly digested food and digestive juices into the small intestines so that further digestion and absorption can take place an average meal can remain in the stomach for three to four hours um, so the normal pH of the stomach of the gastric contents are pretty acidic and so it's going to be more on the acidic side and so a, a normal pH of the stomach is probably going to be somewhere around four to six because those gastric contents are going to be um, pretty acidic and so um, when we have acid reflux or heartburn as I said before that lower esophageal sphincter has become weakened um, for a variety of reasons um, and so as a result as remember I said that lower esophageal sphincter stays closed typically so that you don't have that backflow of gastric contents but then um, if it's weakened it will allow you know some gastric contents to back up into um, the esophagus which causes um, acid reflux and so then you get the the heartburn and and, and those um, acid reflux type symptoms the small intestines has three sections the duodena the jejunum and the ileum as food passes into the small intestines the end products of digestion are absorbed through its thin mucous membrane lining into the bloodstream carbohydrates fats and proteins are broken down in the small intestines enzymes from the pancreas bile from the liver and hormones from glands of the small intestines all help with the digestive process these secretions mix with the food as it moves through the intestines by peristalsis. The large intestines is responsible for um, a few different things. It absorbs excess water and electrolytes. Um, it's uh, responsible for storing food residue and eliminating waste products from in the form of feces, feces being stool. The large intestines includes the cecum, the ascending colon, the, trans, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. 
the rectum and the anus are also a part of the, uh, the large intestines in that particular order. The appendix is just a finger-like projection and it's actually attached to the cecum. So remember we said a part of the large intestine's um, responsibility is absorbing excess water. So um, when you have um, uh, stool uh, going through or feces passing through um, the intestines as it's inner entering into the ascending colon that um, has not really gone through the large intestine so it hasn't had opportunity to absorb all that excess water so in the ascending colon um, and it'll come be more um, uh, understandable when we talk about ostomies um, when you have ostomies in that ascending colon the stool coming out is still going to be pretty liquidy because it has not gone through um, the intestines, the large intestines. The transverse colon, it's gone through um, uh, a somewhat, not all the way, but somewhat. So some of the fluid's been absorbed. So it's going to be, you know, more soft. By the time it gets to the descending colon, that um, has pretty much gone through the, the entire um, colon. So that uh, any ostomy in the descending colon is going to be um, uh, more formed stool. Um, the sigmoid colon actually um, holds the stool until it's ready to be exited um, from the body. Um, you have some accessory um, GI organs as well. The liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder, bile ducts are also a part of that um, accessory organs. The liver is located in the right upper quadrant under the diaphragm, and it has two major lobes as well. The functions of the liver include metabolizing carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, it also detoxifies the blood. It converts ammonia, uh, ammonia to urea for excretion, and it synthesizes plasma proteins, non-essential amino acids, um, vitamin A, and essential nutrients such as iron and vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin B12. The liver also secretes bile, B-I-L-E, which is a greenish fluid that helps digest fat and absorb um, fatty acids. Um, it absorbs cholesterol and uh, lipids, other lipids as well. Bile, B-I-L-E, also gives the stool its color. So it's important to remember, you know, you'll go through these things in anatomy and physiology, but it's important that you remember some of these things because when you start talking about different um, diseases and things like that of the GI uh, tract, this helps you to better understand uh, why you have certain signs and symptoms or why you need to do certain things or what's going on if you understand um, you know, what each organ does and its purpose. The gallbladder is a small pear-like or pear-shaped organ, and it lies halfway under the right lobe of the liver. Its main function is just basically to store the bile, B-I-L-E, store the bile um, from the liver. So the liver secretes the bile to the gallbladder, and it's stored there until the bile is emptied into uh, the duodenum. The pancreas lies horizontally in the abdomen behind the stomach, and it consists of the head, the tail, and the body. The body of the pancreas lies right uh, in the right upper quadrant, and the tail is in the left upper quadrant. Um, attached to the, and it's attached to the duodenum. The tail of the pancreas touches the spleen. The pancreas releases insulin and glycogen into the bloodstream, and it um, releases pancre pancreatic enzymes into the duodenum for digestion. And then we talked about those bile ducts as well, and they just basically provide a passageway for the bile to travel from the liver to the intestines. So as we get older, um, different uh, digestive changes can occur um, that affects um, 
our nutrition status as we get older. Um, you know, as you get older, you may have dental caries or tooth loss. And so um, these can affect a person's ability to chew. And also remember, we talked about people with ill-fitting or improper fitting dentures. If those dentures don't fit properly and cause sores and things like that, that affects a person's ability to chew. So if a person has any uh, um, impact in their ability to chew, then that's going to impact their um nutrition status as well because they're not going to be eating like they need to. Um, as you get older, you might have a risk for a decreased um, gag reflex. If you don't have that um, uh, proper gag reflex, that increases your risk for aspiration. Remember, we said aspiration is when that swallowing process doesn't um, go as it should and you run the risk of getting food and fluids into the airway. You get food and fluids into the airway, down into the lungs, that causes the risk for um, aspiration pneumonia. A lot of times when we get older, we have a decreased sense of taste, which also may lead to a loss of appetite, um, which further you know, can impact a person's nutrition if they're not eating properly. So in your book, there's a tape, a box 26.1 that provides some healthy lifestyle recommendations for our digestive system. And so we'll just go through a few of them. So when we talk about use up at least as many calories as you take in, that's what happens with obesity when we're taking in more calories than we're actually using up. So you want to know how many calories you're eating and drinking. Um, and increase your physical activity as needed to match the number of calories that you consume. Uh, if you're trying not to gain weight, don't consume more calories than you know you can burn up every day. Plan for 150 minutes of moderate physical activity or 70 minutes of 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week. Um, or you can do a combination of both. If you uh, cannot do long periods, try to do a minimum of 10 sessions of activity spread over a week to equal the recommended amount. It goes on to say, eat a variety of nutritional foods from all of the food groups. Choose foods such as vegetables and fruits and whole grain products, fat-free or low dairy products, and nuts are, are, are good for you. Um, eat skinless fish at least twice a week, especially fish high in omega-3 fatty acids. Like, so that would be like your salmon, your trout, things like that. Use non-tropical cooking oils to reduce your risk for coronary artery disease. Um, eat less of the nutrient-poor foods and limit how much saturated fats, trans fats or cholesterol and sodium you eat. You want to choose lean meat and poultry without skin and prepare them without added saturated and trans fat. Select fat-free, 1% fat or low uh, fat dairy products. Cut back on foods containing hydrogenated vegetable oils and that'll reduce your trans fat. Um, reduce foods high in dietary cholesterol. Um, you wanna aim to eat less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol each day. You want to cut back on foods and beverages high in calories and uh, low in nutrients or with added sugar. So cut back on those types of things. Um, you want to choose and prepare foods with little or no salt. Aim to eat less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day. If you drink alcohol, drink in moderation. That means one drink per day for females or two for males. And then follow the um, American Heart Association recommendations when you eat out. Okay, and watch your portion sizes. So those are some things that um, it suggests to do to maintain um, a healthy digestive system. So some other changes in the digestive system that occur with aging. Um, decreased muscle tone at the sphincters. And so, again, going back to when we talked about that lower esophageal sphincter. Over time, uh, certain things that we eat, um, smoking, you know, smoking can decrease the or weaken that lower esophageal sphincter. Certain foods that we eat 
um, like onions, raw onions and peppermints and things like that can weaken that lower esophageal sphincter. So if you've done that over a lifetime, um, then that puts us at risk for what we call GERD, gastroesophageal uh, reflux as we get older. Um, also, um, decreased gastric secretions um, as you get older. If you have decreased gastric secretions, that can interfere with digestion because we need those gastric secretions to help with the digestion of food. So then um, maybe our food isn't getting digested fully, right? Decreased peristalsis, that's the movement of that food along the GI tract. And so if that's decreasing, that puts us at risk for constipation. So um, to try to you know combat constipation, we wanna make sure we're educating our patients on um, a good hydration, you know, drinking um, plenty of fluids. A normal, healthy adult should be drinking 2,000 to 2,500 mLs of fluid a day um, to maintain good GI health. Also, um, increasing foods uh, with fiber. So whole grains, things like that can help um, with, uh, you know, that decreased peristalsis or, you know, increased risk of constipation. So educating your patients um, on those things as well. So when we talk about metabolism, metabolism is basically the process of changing food into energy. And so, um, you know, your book talks about this, um, how over the past uh, several years, actually, I think it says something about over the past 100 years or so, um, how the economy has um, moved to more um, technology based and so therefore um, more sediment sed sedentary so uh, meaning not active so we not lead an active lifestyles which um, increases the risk or rise in obesity in the United States and so if we're not um, properly metabolizing that food, we need to get up and get moving um, and be more, become more active versus uh, being a couch potato. And so that um, we don't, you know, we're not able to, you know, um, properly metabolize that food when we're leading a sedentary lifestyle and not uh, moving. Um, that also can put us at risk. Being sedentary puts us at risk for constipation if uh, things aren't moving um, properly, you know, uh, with peristalsis and things like that as well. So we need to become more active as well. Okay, the My Plate was developed by the USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion to promote healthy diets for all. Americans. And so we should focus on a variety of amount and um, choice of nutrient dense foods. Um, so like we said, your daily diet should be low in saturated fats, low in trans fats, low in sodium, um, low in added sugars and things like that. You want to begin by making small changes and build towards a healthier food, um, build toward healthier food and uh, beverage choices um, if you can. You want to make sure you're eating it the correct number of calories. And so, you know, that would be based on your age, your sex, your activity level, your height and weight and things like that. Uh, you want to make sure you're choosing foods from the five food groups to make sure you have the necessary nutrients. So your vegetables, your fruits, your grains, um, your protein, your dairy. You want to fill half your plate with vegetables and fruits. Um, and you want to vary the food selections. You want to make selections from dairy food groups that are high in calcium. You want to choose fresh fruits instead of frozen or canned foods if possible. Canned foods tend to be uh, pretty high in sodium. You want to manage your weight. So um, avoid also avoid eating. So that would mean avoid eating um, oversized food portions. Uh, you want to balance calories that you ingest from foods and beverages uh, with the amount of calories that you expend. So 
you know, if you're not going to be uh, doing a lot of activity and things like that, you don't want to be taking in an excessive amount of calories. Um, you want to uh, prevent gradual weight gain over time. And you do that by making small decreases in calories and increasing your physical activity. You want to try to drink water instead of beverages that contain sugar. And so, like I said, a lot of things can interfere with people eating a healthy diet. Um, dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. So if we're having dysphagia, then we're not taking in the proper amount of nutrients. Um, low income. Maybe you're telling me to, to, to eat all these healthy foods, but I can't really afford, you know, to eat all these healthy foods. The only thing I can afford is this pack of hot dogs and some bread or whatever. So that can prevent me from eating a healthy diet as well. Um, and so no food available. If I don't have food available, I can't eat a healthy diet. If I'm weak, you know, I might not be able to eat a healthy diet. If I have dementia, I'm not um, thinking about, you know, uh, how to eat a healthy diet or things like that. So those are some things that can uh, prevent us from eating, you know, and, and maintaining a healthy diet. And uh, as we, you know, assess in our patient, look at those things. Okay, so um, proteins are essential amino acids and they cannot be synthesized by the body and they must be obtained in the diet. Proteins are needed for energy, growth, bodily repair, maintenance of fluid and electrolytes, and the production of enzymes, hormones, and antibodies. So in other words, they rebuild and replace body tissue. Um, they also help with hormone production, fluid balance, and help to, uh, with the transport of nutrients in the body. Basically, probably most, if not all, hospital, uh, all hospitalized patients are in need of um, proteins. And insufficient protein intake can lead to um, protein energy malnutrition and that would be characterized by muscle wasting um, proteins provide around four calories per gram so for every gram of protein you typically get about four calories high quality proteins are found in meat, fish, poultry, eggs, dairy products, and dried beans. So when we talk about some good sources, you've got animal sources. So your red meats, your eggs, milk, milk products, poultry, fish, those type things provide poultry. When you talk about plant sources of where you get your proteins, that would be like your grains, your legumes, most of your vegetables. Um, so uh, you know, people that are vegetarians or vegans or whatever would have, need to think about that. What are some other areas that they would uh, typically get their protein from? The average dietary reference intake uh, for protein is 46 to 56 grams of protein per day for the healthy person. And so your protein intake should be about 10 to 15 percent of your total calories, um, which this could vary, you know, depending on your activity level, what is your health, um, what is your state of health, um, the availability of protein in the food sources. So to calculate the protein requirement per day for a healthy adult, we're talking about a healthy adult. You want to take the pounds in kilograms and multiply that um, by 0 0.8. And that will give you the grams of protein needed uh, a day for a healthy adult. So if you go back to um, when we talk about medication calculation, how do we convert our pounds into kilograms? And so you would take the pounds um, divided by 2.2. So if I weighed 135 pounds, I'd divide that by 2.2, and that would give me my weight in kilograms. So then you would take the weight in kilograms and multiply that by um, 
0.8, and that would give you the total grams of protein per day uh, that's needed for a healthy adult. So there are times when the body actually needs more protein. So anytime you have some type of illness or injury or um, during rapid tissue growth, such as, um, you know, pregnancy or lactation or something like that, you would need uh, increased amount of protein to help with the, um, the rebuilding uh, process in the body. Protein deficiency can result from having uh, an unbalanced diet and not taking in enough, um, not taking in enough proteins. So we talk about uh, two types of um, protein deficiency, miras marasmus and quashi or core. So um, marasmus is the result of severe starvation and the body starts to use carbohydrates and fats for energy. If it's not treated, it can lead to death as well. Kawashi um, or core is a condition that occurs in infants and young children um, soon after they're weaned from uh, breast milk. And so um, their diet is deficient in proteins. So Kawashi or core differs from Erasmus in that um, adequate energy from other nutrients may be consumed. However, the diet, like I said, is deficient in um, deficient in proteins. Some um, symptoms of Kawashi or core might include edema, um, pigment changes in the hair and the skin, uh, impaired growth and development, uh, uh, distension of the abdomen, and liver changes might occur with that. And so like this protein is the main component in hair and deficiency of it can lead to changes in color and texture. So when we talk about um, malnutrition in your book, there's a table 26.8 on page 478 that um, uh, talks about physical signs indicating possible malnutrition. So it goes through, you know, we won't go through all of it. You can take a look at the table, but it goes through, you know, changes in your hair, your face, your eyes, your lips, your tongue, um, teeth, gums, glands and the uh, nervous system and so um like we said you know with the hair normal would be shiny firm well rooted type hair signs associated with malnutrition um there's a lack of that natural shine it's dull it's dry it's thin um dispigmented so changes in the color or whatnot and so um like i said kawashi or core um, and less commonly would be marasmus protein deficiency, um, would be nutritional deficits causing that. Um, some non-nutritional um, problems with the hair might be excessive bleaching of the hair or um, alopecia or things like that. Um, you know, and you can kind of just go on down the list and see, you know, what things um might be for example teeth it goes talks about teeth um typically the normal teeth should have no cavities no pain they should be bright if you have malnutrition um you might have um cavities or also called caries um the enamel might be mottled you might have missing teeth things like that um might be indications of malnutrition So athletes or people that are very active may need a higher um, higher diet or higher protein diets. Um, but if you don't need a higher protein diet and you do take in um, that excessive amount of protein, that puts um, stress on the liver and the kidneys. So um, 
when the liver the liver is going to struggle to keep up with the extra protein um, that needs to be metabolized in the body and that can lead to excess fat in the diet um, so high fat diet can lead to as we talked about obesity um, it can lead to heart disease and it can lead to certain types of cancer as well such as colon cancer breast cancer pancreatic cancer prostate cancer those type things as well so if you don't um, need that excessive amount of protein in the diet then there's no need for you to um, take in excessive amounts of protein so we talked about how to calculate um, with the normal healthy adult would need as far as protein intake so um, there's no need to you know go above and beyond that unless something else is going on so um, we have uh, several types of vegetarian um, diets we have um, lacto ovo vegetarian and so that one um, dairy products eggs and plant foods are included in the diet um, we have lacto vegetarian which means eggs are excluded and um, dairy products and plant foods are included and then we have vegan and so with a vegan diet all animal food sources are excluded including um, honey so any animal source so no egg no dairy products or things like that all animal food sources are excluded including honey so vegetarians um, need to make sure they still have a well-balanced diet and are still able to get the needed proteins in their diet now if you have a well-planned vegetarian diet <clears throat> it does offer some uh, some health benefits such as decreased risk of heart disease decreased risk of hypertension decreased risk of diabetes decreased obesity but it has to be well planned you still need to make sure you're getting all the nutrients um, from uh, you know other sources as well vegans also um, need to ensure that they're getting enough vitamin b6 b12 iron zinc riboflavin riboflavin vitamin d um, because they're cutting out um, all animal food sources um, so vegetarians where can they get their protein from since uh, they're not eating meats and things like that where we have you know a large amount of our proteins come from so where can it, vegetarians get their proteins from they can get their proteins from whole grains legumes um, nuts or seeds they can get it from soybeans um, dairy products as well um, you know so just need to be mindful that um, they are taking in uh, the necessary nutrients to to maintain their health as well okay so carbohydrates include starches sugars such as um, fructose glucose lactose sucrose and cellulose the carbohydrates provides four calories per gram and and so and they're a key source of uh, key source of energy so like I said carbohydrates they're a main source of your energy they regulate protein and fat metabolism they help fight infection they promote um, growth of body tissues they're found in fruits vegetables milks grains um, they promote normal metabolism including fat metabolism and they prevent protein from being used um, for energy so if you don't have enough carbohydrates then the body starts to break down um, pro protein for energy insufficient intake results in protein and fat being used for for energy you got three types of carbohydrates simple complex and fiber so let's talk about each of those 
So your simple carbohydrates, these can be quickly absorbed into the bloodstream, which means they cause the, um, the serum glucose to rise quickly. And so these sources are used for diabetics who have low blood sugar. Um, in non-type 1 diabetic people, these simple sugars uh, stimulate in insulin production. So this, these things are like uh, your milk sugar, so the lactose, fruit sugars, so uh, like fructose, table sugar. So simple sugars are things that's going to get in there and get that um, serum glucose or your blood glucose level up quickly. So complex carbohydrates, they're not going to get your serum blood glucose level up as quick as simple, um, simple carbohydrates will. Or they're broken down into simple sugars and used for the body. And so whereas the uh, simple carbohydrates get that blood glucose up quickly, the complex carbohydrates uh, provide a more consistent serum glucose level. So helping to keep the um, glucose level more consistent, um, it's recommended that 85% to 95% of the consumed carbohydrates are complex carbohydrates. And so these would be things, the complex carbohydrates would come from like breads, pasta, cereals, rice, things like that. And so complex carbohydrates are good, but when you get all these fat diets, they portray it in a bad light because a lot of people tend to consume more complex carbohydrates than necessary. And so um, then it, you know, sheds a bad light on them because they're consuming more than they actually need. Children and adults need a minimum of 130 grams of carbohydrates a day. All right, so when we talk about our fiber carbohydrates, um, these cannot be broken down during digestion. They pass through the intestine undigested and they increase the bulk in the stool. So um, that's why these fiber is good to help prevent constipation. It helps um, aid in elimination. Um, it also can decrease the absorption of, of fat. And so um, these might be considered um, a good source of uh, just snack food um, versus, you know, having some type junk food or something like that. And so things that we can do to get more fiber um, when we talk about, you know, the breads and things like that, we can change the white bread to whole wheat bread to get more fiber. Or instead of having white rice, we can change that and have brown rice to get more fiber. Um, eating whole grains and cereals and pasta. Um, increasing our intake of fruits and vegetables can also help us to get more um, fiber. There's a table actually on page 466, table 26.1, that shows you um, fiber content of selected foods. So when you talk about your fruits, your grains and cereals, vegetables, legumes, things like that, where you can get uh, your fiber from. Okay, fats. So some fats are needed for the body, but most people take in more fat than needed. The recommended daily intake um, of fat is about 20 to 30 grams a day. Fat supplies um, concentrated sources of energy and it provides nine calories per gram. Um, it's needed for proper absorption of fat soluble, fat -soluble vitamins. Uh, it's stored in the body to maintain body warmth and protect internal organs. Um, sources include animal products, egg yolks, organ meats, including liver, uh, butter, cheese, various oils, things like that um, can be described by cholesterol content. Um, so when we talk about cholesterol, you may have heard HDL and LDL. The HDL would be the good cholesterol. The LDL would be considered um, the bad cholesterol. The more solid the fat, the higher the saturated um, fat content would be. Um, too much fat 
as we know, can lead to obesity. It can lead to heart disease. It can cause some cancers if you're taking in too much. But on the opposite side of that, insufficient intake can result in increased risk of infections, skin lesions, um, amenorrhea, which, is, which means uh, no menstruation for women. Um, it can lead to cold sensitivity because of in, uh, insufficient fat stores. Um, so like I said, you know, long, you need to be making sure you're taking in, um, uh, you know, more of the good fat content and not, you know, taking in excessive amounts of it that leads to, you know, some of these other, um, uh, you know, illnesses or diseases or things like that. All right, so you have your saturated and unsaturated fats. When we talk about saturated fats, there's actually a table in your book on page 467, tables 26-2, and it talks about uh, types of saturated fats. And so saturated fats would be like lard, margarine, short, shortening, things like that. Um, you can find that saturated fat in bacon, ham, pork chops, things like that. Chicken, now chicken is actually better without the skin. If you have the skin on it, all that fat content is actually under the skin. So if you take the skin off, then you remove a lot of that uh, saturated fat content. Um, so fatty acids, like I said, they can be saturated or unsaturated. When we talk about unsaturated fats, those are more of the healthier types. So that's in like uh, corn oil, sunflower oil, canola oil, um, things like that. All right, so vitamins are needed to maintain good nutrition. All right, you have your water soluble vitamins and you have your fat soluble vitamins. Um, water soluble vitamins, that would be like your um, B and C vitamins. And these are um, easily absorbed in the bloodstream and um, so for the body and easy for the body to use. And they're also um, easily excreted from the, from the body. Your fat soluble vitamins would be like your vitamin A, D, E, and K. And those are stored and can cause toxicity if they're taken in excess. These fat soluble vitamins um, are absorbed in the small intestines, um, the same as other fats. Um, so remember we talked about the bile, B-I-L-E, um, helps to break down or digest the fats. And so that's where these fats are um, digested and broken down in the duodenum. Um, your book goes over, um, well, first of all, there's a table on 467, table 26.3, that gives you some recommendations for your vitamin D intake, how much vitamin D intake, um, recommended daily intake you should be having based on your age, or it also talks about, you know, what pregnant and breastfeeding women need. Also in your book on pages um, 468 and 469, there is a table 26.4 that actually goes through each vitamin, their major function, where you can get it from, what happens if you're deficient in that vitamin, what happens if it's it's an excessive amount of that vitamin. And so um, I'm not going to go over each one of those vitamins, but make sure you take a look at it. But we can just kind of, you know, look at it just briefly here. So for instance, if you talk about vitamin K, which is a fat soluble vitamin, um, when we talk about the major function, it's necessary for blood clotting. Where can we get vitamin K? In our dark green leafy vegetables, cauliflower, soybean oil, green tea, um, things like that. If you have a deficiency in um, vitamin K, then it can cause, um, cause you to hemorrhage. And an excessive amount of it is not really um, known. So um, 
you know, take, like I said, take a look at that. Um, and kind of like, let's talk, let's look at vitamin A. That's another uh, fat soluble vitamin, the major function of it. Um, it's important for night vision. It's necessary for adequate immune response. Um, you can get it from liver, dark green leafy vegetables, um, deep orange vegetables and fruits if you're deficient in it. Um, it can cause night blindness, rough dry skin, dry mucous membranes, um, things like that. Excessive amounts of vitamin A can cause appetite loss, hair loss, dry skin, bone joint pain. So take a look at, like I said, take a look at that and kind of see, you know, um, what each vitamin is used for and where you can get it from. And if you have too much or don't have enough, what types of things can happen to the body. All right, so we also have minerals. Now, minerals are necessary for metabolism um, in the body, um, cell function to take place in the body, um, proper muscle and nerve function as well. Um, you have some major minerals in the body. The major minerals in the body would include things like calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, sulfurous, I'm sorry, sulfur, chlorine, and you have some trace minerals in the body, uh, trace minerals as well. Those would include things like iron, copper, iodine, um, manganese, cobalt, zinc, um, selenium, fluoride. So on page 470 and 471 in your book, there's another table, table 26.6, and it goes over the um, minerals in the body. Again, we're not going to go through each one, but it discusses the function of each mineral, where you can get it from, the, if you don't have enough, what happens, if you have too much, what can happen. So let's, for instance, let's look at calcium. Calcium, the major function is muscle contraction and relaxation. Um, coagulation, building of strong bones and teeth. It plays a role in the nervous system function and it aids in blood coagulation. So where can we get calcium from? Milk and milk products, dark green leafy vegetables, soybeans, sardines, salmon with bones, um, tofu and other soy products, and hard water. Now, if we don't have enough calcium in the body, what can happen? We can have poor bone growth um, and tooth development, poor blood clotting, um, osteoporosis, rickets in children, um, osteomalacia in adults, possible hypertension. If you got too much calcium in the body, it can lead to kidney stones in, um, in some individuals. Um, sodium. Let's look at sodium. What is the function of sodium? Acid base balance, fluid balance, transmit nerve impulses, and helps control um, muscle contractions. And so, uh, if we uh, are, where can we get it from? Salt, basically, you know, salt. So, things that are high in salt, so processed foods, milks, milk products, um, several vegetables, things like that is where we can get our sodium from. If we don't have enough, we can have hyponatremia, uh, which can uh, cause edema of the lower extremities. If we have too much of it, it can cause hypertension and lead to um, renal disease and cardiovascular disease and things like that. Now, if you take a look on um, page 469, table 26.5, there's a table there that says selected foods with high sodium content. So like I said, your canned foods are going to have a lot of um, sodium in them. So um, cream of potato soup, you can see how much a cup of that would be. Tomato soup, you can see. So you can see these things are pretty high in sodium. Fast foods, fast foods are going to be high in sodium. Um, and then it gives you some other um, uh, things, you know, uh, and their sodium content. So if you have a patient that's on um, a low sodium diet, then you need to know what types of things you need to be educating them on to um, avoid, uh, you know, if they're on low sodium diet or things like that. So take a look at those charts as well. All right, so water is also a nutrient that's needed by the body. 
the um, average adult body is about 50 to 69 percent um, water, made up of 50 to 69 percent water. Um, it's used in almost every body process from digestion to absorption to elimination or secretion, and a large amount is stored in the body. And so a general rule of intake should be equal to your recorded output plus an additional 500 on top of that. So if your recorded output is um, 1,000, you add 500 onto that. That should be your um, uh, just a general rule uh, for your intake needs. So sometimes uh, water is essential for life but sometimes a person might need a fluid restriction. Um, you know, if they have a condition, congestive heart failure, where they're retaining fluid or any other um, diabetes insipidus or something, I'm sorry, not diabetes insipidus, but um, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, where they're um, retaining fluid or something like that. Um, anytime they're in fluid overload, they might need um, to be on a fluid restriction because if the body's already retaining fluid, you don't want to continue to add an excessive amount of um, fluid into the, on the body. So any type condition there where they are having fluid overload and need to be on a fluid um, restriction, you want to make sure you're monitoring your intake and output very carefully. You want to make sure um, you're monitoring daily weights. Another thing when you're monitoring daily weights to um, get an accurate reading if you're monitoring for fluid overload. You want to monitor that weight every morning uh, before they eat, after they urinate, in the same amount of clothing um, every day to make sure you're getting an accurate um, weight on that person. Okay, so let's look at these questions here. Which nutrition, nutrient is involved in all the body's chemical processes and the most essential of all nutrients? Water, protein, sodium, sugars. So the answer is um, water. Water is the most essential of all nutrients. Um, the adult body is 50 to, to, what did we say, 50 to 69% water. Um, and so, um, Again, like we said, it's used in every body process, including digestion, absorption, elimination, um, secretion, and all those things. So one is your answer. Okay, let's look at question two. All of the following are functions of fat, except they, one, provide a source of fatty acids, two, add flavor to foods, three, make food smell appetizing, or four, provide a quick source of protein. So your answer for that one is gonna be four. Carbohydrates are what provide a quick source of um, energy. Fats can be burned as a source of energy, but they are not a quick source of energy and are primarily used when carbohydrates are not available. Okay, so a lot of things can influence or impact a person's nutritional status. Um, for instance, the very young, um, they're dependent on others to make sure they have um, very well-balanced um, diets that can impact, you know, their nutritional status. When we talk about older adults, um, a lot of different things happen. Physiologic changes happen, physical limitations, maybe they got arthritis or um, you know, different things going on that's preventing them from being able to um, uh, properly take in the nutrients that they need. Maybe they've had a stroke. They might have difficulty swallowing or whatnot. Maybe um, we're talking about adolescents. Adolescents, maybe they're, you know, being influenced by their peers. You know, they might eat a lot of fast foods, things like that. A person's emotional status can impact um their uh, nutritional status if they're 
um, emotionally unstable. Maybe they're not um, taking in proper nutrients. If they're ill, illness can impact because, um, you know, you're, you have anorexia when you're, you're ill. You don't want to eat. Um, and so that can impact your nutritional status. Your economic status, you know, as we said before, can impact your nutritional status. Um, you're the nurse teaching these patients to eat these healthy diets, but if all they can afford is a, a pack of hot dogs or whatnot, then, um, you know, that's going to impact their nutritional status. Maybe they can't afford um, the healthy things that you're um, asking them to. Um, also, religion and culture can impact um, a person's nutritional status. There are some, you know, uh, 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 religions and cultures that practice, you know, eating certain foods. For example, um, your book talks about Islam, which uh, says no pork or pork pork products and no alcohol. Judaism, they said um, foods are grown, harvested, or processed in a kosher manner. So um, they're prepared using or, or according to the Jewish law. Um, separate dishes and pans and silverware must be used to prepare and serve meat and dairy food. Uh, meat and milk may not be eaten at the same meal. Pork, shellfish, crustaceans and birds of prey are not allowed. Orthodox Jews follow stricter guidelines. Seven day of Venice, uh, no stimulants such as coffee or tea. Shellfish, pork and alcohol must be avoided. Uh, many of the lacto ovo vegetarians um, of these seven day Venice are lacto ovo vegetarians. Um, and so they have an emphasis on whole grain foods. When we talk about culture, we got different cultures. Um, uh, your book talks about African Americans and says typical foods in the traditional African American diet are um, a variety of greens. So like collard greens, mustards, turnips, kales, things like that. Dry beans, cornbread, sweet potatoes, pork, catfish, chicken. Um, most of the meats and fish are prepared by frying, which of course we know. Um, can be unhealthy. Seasons for vegetables might include uh, smoked bacon, ham, salted pork. So these are things high in sodium. Desserts may include sweet potato pie, peach cob cobbler, fried pies, and things like that. Hispanic Americans. The Hispanic diet is high in carbohydrates such as beans, rice, corn, tortillas. Um, meats and meat dishes are heavily seasoned and spicy, and the diet can be high in fat because of the use of lard in a, um, when they prepare the fried foods. Um, desserts might be very sweet and may be prepared with uh, syrup-like sauces. So there is a table in your book, table 26.7 on page 476 that goes through um, culturally diverse food patterns of Americans. So it talks about um, African Americans, Chinese Americans, Jewish American, uh, Lat uh, Lat uh, Latin American, Italian, Japanese, Mexican, American Indian, Puerto Rican, Vietnamese, and Middle Eastern Americans. So take a look at that and, uh, you know, kind of go through um, the culturally diverse food patterns. Now, we cannot tell someone um, they can't eat something. It's a, if it's a part of their religion or a part of their culture, then um, we need to find a way in which we can work with the person to try to uh, modify their diet, but staying within the cultural um, or religious tradition of their diet to try to accomplish a more um, healthy diet. So how can we stay within their cultural confines or their religious diet, but making it more healthy or um, conducive to whatever their condition is? Are they, if they are, um, maybe they have congestive heart failure and we need them to have a uh, low sodium diet or something like that. Well, how can we um, still stay within the cultural or religious diet, but uh, you know, prepare the foods with less salt.
or less fat or would not stand within those cultural confines. Okay, so your book goes also goes through um, nutritional needs through um, the lifespan, starting with infants. So when we talk about infants, um, it's breast milk is recommended. Um, that's you know better for the baby for the first full year um, of the baby's life. Um, then you have uh, formulas that they can use. It's a modified form of cow's milk. So the baby's weight or the infant's weight should double. Um, they should double their birth weight by six months, and then they should triple their weight by um, year one. So if baby was um, 10 pounds, yeah, that's probably excessive, right? But if the baby was 10 pounds at um, birth and then at six months, they should double that. So they would be 20 pounds, right? And then at a year, they should be um, triple that when we talk about how much weight they should be uh, gaining. When they get to be toddlers and preschoolers, um, that's around ages two to five, um, they start to consume less milk and increase their intake of solids. Um, you want to provide them small portions or servings, um, offer foods that are easy to chew. You want to um, uh, they they you want to avoid combination foods. They prefer single item foods that don't touch each other. Try um, things that are colorful, you know, carrots, peas, things like that. Um, provide a pleasant um, environment at meal times, right? Um, don't force them to eat. Um, you want to provide plates and utensils in a size that um, that can easily be handled by the small child. Um, use colorful dishes, things like that. When we talk about school age, they might desire sweet, non nutritious food so they want soda candy cake ice cream but right we need to have make sure they still have a well-balanced um, diet and so make sure they eat breakfast before they go to school um, provide a nutritious um, after school snack um, things like that things high in calorie um, and things like that um, can you know stuff that's high in calories and high in sodium I should say can uh, increase the child's risk for um, obesity. Uh, when we talk about adolescents, we know they like fast foods and things like that. Um, things from the vending machine and stuff. Um, also, when they are having a growth spurt, they their body might require more calories as well as nutrients when they when they're going through. Um, a growth spurt. Female adolescents might require increased levels of iron when they, um, after they start their menstrual cycle. So keeping that in mind as well. Adults, adults can, you know, we get into our busy lives, our hectic lives and things like that. And so we tend to start to rely more on fast food, convenient food, things like that. Then we start with, the, then obesity and hypertension start to develop. Um, we get increased uh, amounts of fat and sodium in our diet, increased amount of sugar in our diet. Exercise starts to go down. So we need to, you know, make sure we're having um, a balanced life, you know, even with all the, the hustle and bustle and things like that, try to, you know, continue to balance those things out. Because remember, if we're taking in more calories and fat and then we're burning then obesity does tend to um, set in so uh, make sure we're exercising and having a well-balanced diet older adults older adults are most at risk for um, altered nutrition or inadequate nutrition um, they might because of you know a lot of things could be going on um, they have may have decreased um, activity for health reasons or whatever uh, may have a decreased calorie intake need um, physical limitations may make it difficult to prepare food 
um, uh, maybe companionship would be helpful during meals. Um, a lot of times our older adults might have limited income. They've retired and they, you know, on a set income. You know, I've seen situations where the older adult have had to make the choice. Do I buy my food? Do I buy my medication this month? Do I pay my rent? Do I buy food or whatever? So they might have limited income and keeping those things um, in mind. Um, if possible, you know, if the condition doesn't, you know, um, prevent it, encourage um, some type of regular daily exercise. Uh, you know, a lot of things can prevent that, you know, whether they can't get out and walk. Um, health conditions are causing them to, you know, be inactive. Uh, you know, they can't afford to get a, a membership to a gym or anything like that. And so, you know, keeping those things in mind. And so maybe being creative in how we can, you know, help them you know, become more active as well. All right, let's look at question four. Sandy works in a pediatrician's office. A mother who brings in her nine-month-old baby is asking nutrition advice and what an appropriate weight would be for her infant. Which statement is appropriate? One, most babies double their weight by the end of the first year. Two, the American Academy of Pediatric recommends breastfeeding for the first six months of life. Three, nutrients found in formulas are easier to digest for, bi for babies than breast milk. Four, most babies double their weight by six months and triple it by one year. The answer, four, most babies double their weight by six months and triple it by one year. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends breastfeeding for one year. And nutrients found in breast milk are easier to digest than in formulas. Okay, question five. Ashley's patient has a body mass index of 16.5 for an adult male. This would mean her patient is one, underweight, two, overweight, three, in the recommended range, or four, morbidly obese. So the answer here is um, actually underweight. So it would be one. The recommended range for BMI is 18.5 to 24.9. A BMI that's less than 18.5 is considered underweight. A BMI between 25 and 29.9 is overweight. And more than 30 is considered obese. A BMI that's greater than 40 is considered morbidly obese. There's actually a chart in your book on page 477 that um, is figure 26.5, and it shows you a diagram of um, what your BMI should be. And so you can see there. So the BMI is basically um, a formula based on your height and weight, which you should, um, which your height and weight should be in proportion to one another. You can see here, if you're um, in the gray here, if you fall in the gray here, the height is on the, the left side and the weight is there on the top. And so if you uh, come together, you can see what your BMI would be. So let's give an example. Say I am um, six feet, two inches and weigh uh, uh, 150 pounds. So that we would go over, so 6.2, go down to 6.2, and then over to, I think I said 150 pounds. That will put us in the green with a BMI of 19, which is normal. Um, so you can kind of see what the BMI should be there for a person.